Rachel Barber, a 15-year-old from Praran, Australia, was a young girl with the face of an angel, a figure like a supermodel and captivating emerald eyes that enchanted anyone who met her. The eldest of three sisters, Rachel was the pride and joy of her parents, Michael and Elizabeth. In their eyes, she was the perfect daughter, setting an exemplary standard for her younger siblings. Rachel showed an early aptitude for the arts, particularly passionate about dance from a young age. She enrolled in ballet classes, where her instructors quickly recognized her extraordinary talent, far surpassing that of her classmates. Michael and Elizabeth were always supportive of their children's passions. Seeing Rachel's desire to practice dancing at home, they converted a bedroom into a mini dance studio to enable her to pursue her passion. As Rachel grew older and her dancing skills advanced, she asked her parents to let her drop academic studies to attend the local dance factory, aiming to become a professional ballet dancer. Everyone could see Rachel had the talent and beauty to shine. She was a dance artist with a promising future ahead. Her parents fully supported her decision. Rachel's life was busy due to the school's distance from home. Every day, her parents would drive her to the local tram station. From there, Rachel would travel to the city center for school. After classes, she would walk back to the tram station, where her parents would pick her up at the same spot they dropped her off in the morning. Life was peaceful and happy until the spring of 1999. On the morning of March 1st, 1999, like any other day, the Barber family woke up to prepare for the new day, blissfully unaware of the tragic events that were about to unfold and change their lives forever. At 6 a.m., Rachel woke up to the sound of her alarm clock and got ready for school. Dressed impeccably in black trousers, a green shirt, her favorite shoes, some assorted jewelry, and her school backpack, she quickly had breakfast and left the house with her father, Michael. While Rachel was a confident dancer on stage, off stage she was shy, innocent, and had been protected by her parents her whole life. That fateful morning, Rachel's father dropped her off at the tram station around 9 a.m. and agreed to meet her there again at 6.15 p.m. after her school day ended. Rachel hugged her father goodbye, wishing him a good day before leaving. If only Michael had known that this was the last time he would ever hug his daughter, he might have held her tighter or never let her go. Unfortunately, life's fragile happiness and life-altering events can happen at any time. We can never fully understand the word unexpected, and that was true for Michael, who bid his daughter farewell without the faintest idea of the grim fate awaiting her that day. Rachel took the tram to the city center where her school was located. Upon arriving, she met her boyfriend, Manny, and other classmates. They all walked to school together in high spirits. Rachel excitedly told everyone she was about to make a significant amount of money that night. When her friends became curious and pressed her for details, Rachel just shook her head, saying she couldn't tell them exactly how, but assured them that her wallet would be full the next day. Rachel was undeniably beautiful, a fact known to all, leading her friends to speculate that her secret job must be something in modeling or advertising. That lunchtime, Rachel and Manny walked a few blocks from the dance factory to a nearby shopping center. After eating, Rachel popped into a store to show Manny a pair of shoes she had long coveted. They were a stunning pair of blue shoes. Every time she visited the mall, Rachel would drag Manny into the store to check if the shoes were still there. She adored them, but their price was far beyond what students like Rachel and Manny could afford. However, that day, Manny was shocked when Rachel asked the sales staff to hold the blue shoes for her, insisting she would return the next morning to purchase them. Clearly, Rachel was about to come into a significant sum of money to dare such an expensive purchase. Manny was intensely curious about what this secret job could be. He pressed Rachel for details, but she would only say she was meeting an old friend who had found her some work. 
Rachel explained that the job would take only about half an hour and was completely harmless, but it required secrecy. Rachel's face lit up with excitement. She said she was going to make a lot of money and even receive gifts. Despite Manny's worry and continued questioning, Rachel steadfastly kept the secret and disclosed no further details. Vanished. Naively, Rachel had no idea that secrets can sometimes be deadly. After school, around 5 p.m., she and her classmates left the school and walked towards the tram station to head home. Instead of catching the usual tram, Rachel bid everyone farewell and caught a different one to her mysterious appointment. She kissed Manny goodbye, promising to call him once she got home. The image of Rachel walking away that day would forever be etched deeply into Manny's memory. Rachel's mother, Elizabeth, glanced at the clock after finishing dinner preparations. Wondering why it was already past 6.30 and the two hadn't returned home. They were usually punctual and seldom came home late. Soon after, the telephone rang, startling Elizabeth. She quickly answered and sighed in relief upon hearing her husband's voice on the other end. However, Elizabeth's heart sank when Michael mentioned he could not find any trace of Rachel. Elizabeth and Michael had every reason to be worried because they realized that Rachel had not contacted anyone in the house that day. Furthermore, she had been followed by some unsavory individuals on a few occasions before. Rachel's parents also knew she feared the dark and never left school this late. Immediately, Elizabeth contacted the Box Hill Police Station to report Rachel missing. Yet their anxiety deepened as the police coldly informed them that by law, they had to wait 24 hours before they could initiate a search. While Rachel's parents were fraught with extreme worry, the police indifferently advised them to remain calm, suggesting that teenagers often rebel and leave home for a few days, but return once they tire of being away. Desperate Search It might be true that teenagers often rebel and leave home, but Rachel had never been a rebellious child. Her parents believed they knew their daughter well. They were attentive and always open to listening to their children. Rachel could share anything with them without fear of being reprimanded or punished. The possibility of Rachel running away was inconceivable. When the police turned their backs on them, Mr. and Mrs. Michael decided to take matters into their own hands. They contacted all of Rachel's friends and her boyfriend, gathering information about the secretive job. Rachel mentioned she was going to do that evening. They also discovered that Rachel had taken a different tram after school. Armed with this new information, the Michaels returned to the police station. Elizabeth implored the officers to open an investigation file and help find their daughter. However, once again, the Rachel family faced rejection from the police. They received no support from the authorities. The Box Hill police maintained that Rachel was just another case of a runaway and did not want to waste time and resources searching for her. Dejected, Rachel's parents returned home with heavy hearts, clueless about what had happened to their daughter. The next morning, Rachel remained missing. With no assistance from the police, Mr. and Mrs. Michael decided to continue the search for their daughter on their own. They drove around town, distributing flyers and asking passers-by if they had seen Rachel. Manny also shared that Rachel had ordered a pair of shoes from a shopping center near their institute. Therefore, Rachel's parents headed in that direction to investigate further. The shop staff confirmed Rachel had not come to pick up the shoes she had reserved. Rachel's parents grew even more worried when another employee mentioned that a man had come to the shopping center a few weeks prior, attempting to lure young girls into working for the red light district, rumored to be a notorious criminal recently released from prison. Terrified at the thought that their daughter could be in such a place, Michael and Elizabeth hurried to the red light district to make inquiries. However, 
The workers there assured them they never recruited people off the streets and never hired underage girls, as it would bring significant legal troubles. Although Rachel's parents were somewhat relieved that they did not find her in such a place, their search, once again, hit a dead end. After receiving no help from local law enforcement, the Box Hill community came together to support the Michaels in finding their daughter. By the third day after Rachel's disappearance, the Box Hill police faced extensive criticism from the public. Under increasing community pressure, they finally agreed to open an investigation file and look for Rachel. The first person the police questioned was Manny, as disappearances of young girls often involve their boyfriends in acts of jealousy-driven violence. However, Manny provided the police with solid alibis, proving he had no involvement in Rachel's disappearance. The police then hypothesized that maybe Manny had impregnated Rachel and she ran away because she was afraid to tell her parents. Over and over, Manny insisted that was not the case. Once again, the lack of professionalism and half-hearted investigation by the local police led the inquiry into a standstill until a crucial piece of information came to light. Unraveling the Mystery On March 4th, 1999, a friend of Rachel's named Allison heard about her disappearance and immediately contacted Rachel's family. Allison had met Rachel on the day she went missing, and reported seeing Rachel and another girl at the tram station, waiting for tram number six. Allison also took the same tram and even sat with them for a while. Later, she observed the two girls getting off at the intersection of High Street and William Street. The police were able to confirm this account after reviewing security footage from the tram station. Rachel's mysterious disappearance started to garner media attention due to public pressure, prompting the local police to undertake a more serious investigation. In the first week following Rachel's disappearance, many of her friends and relatives started reaching out to the Barber family to express their concern. Among those who called was a family's former neighbor, Caroline Robertson. Caroline, who was four years older than Rachel, had previously been employed by the Barbers as a babysitter. Like others, Caroline shared her condolences with Rachel's parents and inquired whether the police had uncovered any new leads. The police focused on investigating phone calls made to the Barber family home prior to Rachel's disappearance. It turned out that Caroline had made two calls to the barbers around 5.25 p.m. on February 28th, just before Rachel went missing. Despite years without contact, these two calls lasted approximately 15 to 30 minutes each. The police promptly informed Rachel's parents that Caroline was renting an apartment close to the last known location of Rachel after she got off the tram. Mr. and Mrs. Barber felt a momentary relief, thinking perhaps the police were right and Rachel had run away and was staying with Carolyn. The police tracked down Carolyn's workplace, an electronic store near her apartment. However, they were surprised to learn that Carolyn had taken the day off. They were even more astonished to discover that she had requested leave, starting on the first day of the month, the same day Rachel disappeared. According to the store manager, Caroline had returned to work on March the 2nd, but then called in sick for the rest of the week, claiming she had a cold. When the police questioned Caroline's neighbors, one reported hearing sobbing from Caroline's apartment on March 2nd. The investigation revealed that Caroline's father also visited her after learning she was ill. When questioned by the police, Caroline's father, Mike, recounted that throughout his visit, Caroline kept her bedroom door locked and closed. Colleagues from Caroline's workplace informed the police that she had recently borrowed money from several of them. They mentioned Caroline planned to move some belongings to her father's farm. Since Caroline couldn't drive, she needed money to pay a moving company. The police quickly verified the colleagues' statements. On March 4, 1999, a mover from the company visited Caroline's apartment. 
Caroline told him she needed to transport a statue, which she had already wrapped in blankets and packed in a burlap sack, along with other miscellaneous items. The mover transported the statue to Caroline's father's secluded farm in Kilmore. A Grim Discovery at around 9 a.m. on March 12, 1999, investigators decided to visit Caroline's apartment, hoping to find Rachel there. However, upon arrival, it appeared no one was home. By that afternoon, after obtaining a search warrant, the police returned to the apartment and broke in. The place was in disarray, and when they entered the bedroom, they found Caroline lying face down on the floor, unconscious. She was immediately taken to the hospital. Meanwhile, the police continued to search her apartment. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until they found a bag in Caroline's wardrobe containing small-sized clothing, far too small for Caroline herself. They also discovered notebooks and diaries scattered everywhere, filled with erratic writing. The entries provided the police with crucial information about Carolina and her plans. Carolina had grown up in an unhappy family environment where her parents constantly argued and neglected their children. From a young age, Caroline was insecure and harbored a negative self-image. In her diaries, she described herself as acne-ridden, overweight, and ugly. Since taking on babysitting duties for the Rachel family, Caroline had envied Rachel's life, her beauty, her slim figure, and the loving attention she received from her parents. Caroline felt like an ugly monster, a lost soul, living among people as radiant as angels. Her envy and obsession with Rachel's image intensified, leading to a horrifying idea. She decided to kill Rachel and steal her identity. The police found a name change application in Caroline's apartment. The new name she chose was Rachel Barber. The diary also revealed that Caroline planned to undergo cosmetic surgery to alter her face to resemble Rachel's. She even intended to move to a different city to start a new life as a different person, a new Rachel. Investigators rushed to the hospital to interrogate Caroline. Upon arrival, they found that she had regained consciousness. The police were shocked when Caroline coldly confessed that she had killed Rachel. The officers quickly proceeded to Caroline's father's farm, where they easily located a freshly dug grave. Below the surface, they discovered the body of 15-year-old Rachel Barber, a telephone cord still wrapped around her neck. Caroline admitted she had concocted a meticulous plan to kill Rachel on February 28th. She had called Rachel's house and asked if Rachel would be interested in participating in a psychological survey, explaining that it would only take half an hour to complete and that Rachel could easily earn a few hundred dollars along with gifts from the sponsoring company. However, it was supposed to be a secret study and Rachel was not to discuss it with anyone. Following Caroline's plan perfectly, the innocent Rachel kept her promise. Once Rachel arrived at Caroline's place, she was offered a slice of pizza that Caroline had previously laced with a sedative. After Rachel became drowsy from the drug, Caroline used a telephone cord to strangle her until she stopped breathing. Caroline hid Rachel's body in her wardrobe before figuring out how to dispose of the corpse. The movers had no idea that what they thought was a statue was actually the body of Rachel. Caroline confessed that for a brief moment, as she watched Rachel innocently consume the drugged pizza, a flicker of conscience flashed within her, urging her to abandon her plan. But realizing she had gone too far, the darkness once again enveloped the room, sealing Rachel's tragic fate. In November 2000, Caroline was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The verdict sparked considerable controversy, with many arguing that the sentence was too lenient for the crime she had committed. In January 2015, public outcry surged once again as Caroline was granted clemency and released from prison early. News for you now, a Victorian woman who stalked and murdered her 15-year-old friend in 1999 has just been released on parole after serving 14 years in prison. The pain of Rachel's family remains everlasting, but Rachel's parents believe that Caroline 
has learned her lesson. They have stated that they do not feel threatened by her release, and her living in the same neighborhood as them 